Dear sir, I am anxious to learn about my sisters, from whom I have been separated many years. I have never heard from them since I left Virginia 24 years ago. I am in hopes that they are still living, and I am anxious to hear how they are getting on. I have no other one to apply to but you. Please send the enclosed letter to my sister Jane or some of her family if she is dead. Very respectfully, Hawkins Wilson. Threading the past to the present is important for me. I think it is for those of us that are black because we are such a central part of the history of America. And if our story is not told and included in American history, it just isn't a complete story. Every time we create a family tree, we are writing another chapter in the grand saga of the history of the African-American people uh, in this country. One of the first things African-American people did when they were liberated is write letters to the Freedmen's Bureau or to newspapers searching for their lost relatives. And there are thousands, and Hawkins' letter is one of the most moving examples of this genre. Hawkins Wilson is this formerly enslaved man who wanted to find his family. And these people that he was seeking and that he was searching for were so important to him that he was going to, you know, go into that Freedmen's Bureau field office, recite what he knew, just with the hope that that, that person was going to help him. And you find out that the letter was directed to the wrong place. That's what drew me to Hawkins. The Freedmen's Bureau, it had been conceived by Abraham Lincoln in 1864 to provide provisions, rations, food for the formerly enslaved. With Hawkins' letter, we wanted to see if we could find any of his descendants. So in order to find someone, you have to sort of reverse engineer, and that's what we did. You use the information that you have from the Bureau, and then you just keep going through the generations, and then you just take it to today and connect with the descendants, which in this case are Kelly and Miss Marie. We are here. We are here. I am so excited to meet you all. This is... Oh, there's so much to discuss. I really want to take some time to talk about how did me and the two beautiful you get to this table? What has your journey been like to, to learn about your family history? Well, it's been a, an amazing experience, number one. I grew up with my grandparents, you know, uh, almost like second parents in a sense. And when they passed away, I still wanted a piece of them, a part of me, and to learn more about their side of the family because we really just didn't know a lot. So that's why I started the family tree, just curious and just really wanted to keep them near and dear to my heart. I have to link it to her because she was the one that was more interested. I knew my grandparents because we lived next door to them, but I knew my father's side of the family because we spent a lot of time with that side of the family. And I just left it up to her because I was satisfied pretty much. <laughs> But the other thing that like is can be a complication in researching, especially African American families, is we were really at the mercy of other people documenting us. Why are the Freedmen's Bureau's records so important? Because it allows you to break through the brick wall. What's the brick wall? Well, everyone will sooner or later hit a brick wall. The paper trail runs out. But for African Americans, the paper trail generally runs out in 1870. Did you? want to try to trace your family during the enslavement time period? Or? I mean, I kind of figured someone was probably a slave or something, but that wasn't a goal to figure out the slave and the owner or whatever else. It was really just to get to know that other side of me, my family, that was never, I don't recall it ever being talked about. Um, so finding that part out and just peeling back, you know, layers of family history and um, was really my main goal. So you all have an incredible family history. You did an amazing job with ancestry, working on your tree, using the hints and, and all of the documents to, to round out your story. And you did trace back, you know, at least to your great 
great grandmother, mm -hmm. Cirilla. Yes. Do you have any memory of her? I no. That that was my grandfather's side of the family. So we only knew his sister. Wow. It was very interesting to see her name, um, and even my great grandparents. It was good to see their names because I didn't get to meet them. Definitely heard stories about them. So when I got the hint, I was like, "Okay, wow! I didn't went to my second great grandmother." So that was exciting. Right, and then even with her death records, again because yeah. access to records is great, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. You got back to her father, yes, who was named I did. Hawkins Wilson. Yes, uh -huh. and. That's pretty much where you just stopped. Just stopped. Yeah. Just stopped. Yeah. Okay. The one thing that I think that when we're on this journey, people think they, they're discovering things. But really all you're doing is sort of lighting a fuse that was always there that you didn't know was there. You have to say the name of your ancestors. If you say their names, you keep them alive. In what I think of as genealogical purgatory, I and mean, when you find them, you open the vault where they've been suspended, and they tell you their stories. I talked earlier about the Freedmen's Bureau. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the quickest ways we can get to finding information about enslaved people. Hawkins went to the Bureau and had someone write out for him the desires of his heart. And it is so intimate, and it is so clear there was no way that once you read this letter, you don't want to know who the people are who were connected to him. And that's you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that letter. And we're going to read through it. Really, you will just hear about a man who survived so much, yet was still hopeful that, that there was more and that his ending would be hearing about him. Dear sir, I am anxious to learn about my sisters, from whom I have been separated many years. I have never heard from them since I left Virginia 24 years ago. I am in hopes that they are still living, and I am anxious to hear how they are getting on. I have no other one to apply to but you, and am persuaded that you will help one stand in need of services as I do. I shall be very grateful to you if you oblige me in this matter. One of my sisters belonged to Peter Coleman in Caroline County, and her name was Jane. Her husband's name was Charles. Dang. And he belonged to Buck Haskin and lived near John Wright's store in the same county. She had three children, Robert, Charles, and Julia. Wow. When I left, <laughs> Sister Martha belonged to Dr. Jefferson, who lived two miles above Wright's store. Sister Matilda belonged to Mrs. Botts in the same county. My dear uncle Jim and a wife at Jack Langley's, and his wife was named Addie, and his oldest son was named Buck. He just knew everyone, and they all belonged to Jack Langley. These are all my own dearest relatives, and I wish to correspond with them with a view to visit them as soon as I can hear from them. Wow, bless his heart. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not done, I'm sorry. My name is Hawkins Wilson and I am their brother who was sold at, wow, at, wow, really? <laughs> Share sale and used to belong to Jackson Talley and was bought by M. Riot Boyton, CH, wow. You will please send the enclosed letter to my sister Jane or of her family. If she is dead, oh wow, I am very respectful, your obedient servant, Hawkins Wilson. Wow, he just, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I keep saying wow, but it's just so rich that he remembers like the journey from Virginia to Texas. And you still remember 24 years being enslaved, captive, that's how I will see it. That's what made him the most resilient to me because when this part of his life took place, he was a child. The thing that I find that's so remarkable with this letter is the detail he gives. Now, while it may have been illegal for them to learn to read and write, Correct. that does not mean that they didn't have a brain and a memory and an oral history and tradition to pass this stuff down. Correct. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? <laughs> I don't know if I can even put it, put it into words. 
hearing about where your family started or and all the things that they had to go through. You, you know, I'm just remembering all 13 of us sitting in my grandparents' living room. We were watching TV and listening to my grandfather tell jokes, you know. <laughs> we never thought growing up that this is what his family had, had to endure. Right. Right. <laughs> now that person that's in here, <laughs> I'm laughing, because I'm thinking like, okay, this is the Hawkins that's in me, because I'm like, okay, now I need to go find the people who did this. <laughs> That's the thing about this part of American history. Because mm -hmm. we can't even make this black history. This is American history. Exactly. Right. How do you humanize slavery? How do you put a face on slavery? How do you allow slavery to express the heart, the feelings of the enslaved through letters like Hawkins? We've got Hawkins coming to Houston and living here. His story ends actually here in Houston. He died here in Houston? He died here. OK. And even though his story ended here in Houston, in terms of him being in Texas, it really began in Galveston. I almost got, like, goosebumps when you said that. <laughs> you should, because you're recommuting with him. Like, I'm about to start crying, because this is just a lot. Give yourself time and space. I don't want to do the ugly cry. <laughs> 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 to think that, because again, we're not rich on family history. Mm -hmm. So to think that we are now about to go to a place where my dear great-great-grandfather once walked and my great-great-grandmother once walked and were raised and oppressed for, for a time, late on finding out that we were free. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Okay. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> there are so many people that believe that these individuals, these incredible people, that they are not documented at all. Like the ink that documented them just evaporated into space. It was the black people who transformed the functions of the Freedmen's Bureau to include finding their lost relatives. Like they turned it into the Bureau of Lost and Found Human Beings. Earlier, you asked me, how did Hawkins get to Galveston? And that's something that we don't have a definitive answer for. What we know is that he either traveled by land or he traveled by water. Mm. So the sounds that you're hearing and the waves that you're watching, that could have been in the conditions he coasted in under to get here. And Galveston was actually one of the ports that enslaved people were brought directly from Africa. So while he had, you know, an established life here in this country, you still have to just think about the thousands, if not millions of souls that crossed these waters at Some one point. Some probably didn't, didn't make it. Right. One thing I'll also bring us back to is that letter. One of the things that you, you talked about when you read it, you talked about Boyton, and it said Boyton C.H. Right. Boyton is a courthouse. That's what I thought it was a courthouse. And it's in Virginia. Oh, oh. Okay. okay. You know, I think that's just so amazing because it's almost like a cry out, right? I may not be able to connect with my family again. Who would have thought that he put those little pearls out there so we can trace back to him? Right. That's beautiful. This is where the journey really sort of begins for you. You didn't even know that it was this close. No. Not at all. And where would you go after that? If there's anything that I could do in my life to dispel the idea that they were invisible on paper, let what we are doing with this speak to the fact that that's not the case, that we did live, we did breathe, we did exist. We are here in Boynton, Virginia. This was a big leap for us. Let me. 
Because that's what I feel like, like I needed to just exhale. I'm feeling a sense of calmness because mm -hmm. now I know where we, you know, where we, my family started. And this is, you know, in some instances, or really, it's ground zero yes. for Hawkins, yeah, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And this courthouse and this place, there's a lot tied to it. In order for you to understand what got Hawkins to this courthouse, we have to start back a little bit before the actual share of cell took place. In 1837, an enslaver named Thomas Talley nearing his, the end of his life, and he gave enslaved people to his children prior to his death. Among those include Hawkins, and not only just Hawkins, but Hawkins' mother. Her name was Gatha, and it was Hawkins and it was his siblings. Now, Hawkins ends up in the possession of Guilford Jackson Talley, who, in late 1842, gets a loan from another person. He places Hawkins as a part of the collateral along with crops and farming implements. Within seven months, Guilford Talley does not meet the terms of the loan, and Hawkins is confiscated and sold as a between six and seven-year-old little boy at this courthouse. What? Wow. I'm standing on the dirt that my great-grandfather stood on, where he probably cried, where he was afraid. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes it more real and just relatable. I can't imagine. I mean, just, just to even think about something like that, you're collateral for someone's debt. I mean, that that is, that's awful. That, you were like a piece of furniture, a, a stove that someone can repossess or or give away. That's that's atrocious, and I, I'm feeling like a little angry right now, yeah. and it's just hard to believe. The slave owners monetize the slave primarily by their age and by their gender. A man in his prime would be the most valuable person on on, um, on a plantation. The slave economy. It was ill. In my experience doing research, I found that enslaved people were monetized at least three ways. One being their physical labor. And then you also had your, you know, virile or your fertile labor. Another way that enslaved people were monetized was literally just breathing. That was the thing that landed Hawkins on those courthouse steps. If you recall, when we read the initial letter where Hawkins laid out his case, right, where he was talking about all the different people, he referenced another letter. Mm -hmm. And this actually is some of the things that you're wondering about in terms of his reaction, maybe the lead up to him getting to this place, he talks about in this second letter. Mm -hmm. And it's addressed to his sister, Jane. Here you go. Dear Sister Jane, your little brother Hawkins is trying to find out where you are and where his poor old mother is. Let me know and I will come to see you. I should never forget the big bag of biscuits you made for me the night I spent with you. Sorry. Your advice to me to meet you in heaven has never passed from my mind. And I have endured to live as near to my God that he saw fit not to suffer us to meet on earth. We might indeed meet in heaven. I was married in the city on the 10th, March, 1867. My wife was from Georgia and was raised in that state and will make me very happy. You may readily suppose that I was not fool enough to marry a Texas girl. <laughs> the audacity, no, <laughs> sorry. I have learned to read and write a little. I teach Sunday school and have very interesting class. I'm writing to you tonight, my dear sister, with my Bible in my hand, praying almighty to God to bless you and preserve you and me to meet again. Thank God that now we are not sold and torn away from each other as we used to be. I must come to conclusion. Best love to yourself, inquiring friends, 
write as quickly as you can and direct to Hawkins Wilson, care of Methodist Episcopal Church, Colored, Galveston, Texas. I, I bid, bid you a pleasant, pleasant night's rest, rest your, your loving and affectionate and brother, brother, Hawkins Wilson. Can I have some Kleenex? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. He said a lot. He, he did. He did. It was amazing that, you know, being torn away from his family as a child, that he didn't lose hope because there was time that, that passed. I guess he had it in, in his mind that the Lord would lead him eventually, you know, to, to, his, to his family. The slave system was designed to chop those family trees down. But now we can resurrect those trees through the miracle of the archive through the miracle of those records. This is where he was born. Mm-hmm. This was their land. This whole area that we're looking at right now was Tally land. And so this is part of what they had to sell to? Right. This is part of what they had to give up. If we go back to the letter, remember, that's our roadmap, okay. right? Mm -hmm. One of the individuals mentioned was Uncle Jim. Mm -hmm. Jim is Gatha's brother. What? Oh. This is just too much. <laughs> <laughs> he is. And we found Jim's descendants. What? And living descendants or living his... descendants. Living? Oh, this is okay. just too much. Okay. He gotta be smiling. Like, I didn't make it. <laughs> but they did. We're back. And here we are. That just uh, rends your heart. He understood the importance of family, of bringing together the branches of your family tree. And that's what has been done for his descendants. You all share DNA with people that come from this community. So you are within a cemetery full of family members. <laughs> wow. This is a family reunion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Hey, George. Yeah. Hey, How's it going? I'm from cold. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> it's both. Here. Meet your family. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm Linda. Hi, Linda. I'm Kelly. Kelly, I'm nice Kelly. to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Marie. Hi, Marie. Hello. 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 Are you guys huggers at all? Yes. yes. And so are we. Okay. And we're good. <laughs> <laughs> It's no accident that where we sit right now is facing humanity. Obviously, with headstones, this looks like a graveyard because that's what it, that's what it is, but those are human beings. That's where we start. We are truly sharing the people whose shoulders we stand on today. It's exciting to find out, to finally see those distant cousins, if you will, near. You know, I try not to show my emotions, but they just come on out anyway. <laughs> the whole day has been emotional. Overwhelming is my new word. So I've already started sharing um, part of the story. I um, text my children and my sibling the, um, the article, the letter. Each of them came back and said, wow, I want to know more. Tell me more. It is amazing and it's beautiful that the six-year-old boy sold away from his family and was able to remember 
what angst slavery brought to a child, but we saw the hope yeah. that brought us all here today. Yeah. To learn that the letter was never delivered to his family, but yet still today, the letter was what delivered, delivered, right? Yes. I am so thankful to Kelly and to Valerie because through their trees, we are sitting here right now. <laughs> With my dear cousin. <laughs> that hates bugs. That too. hates bugs too. <laughs> she hates bugs. So that's what's amazing about today is that over 150 years ago, he, he tried. And because he left those biscuit crumbs, <laughs> <laughs> here we are today. That's so amazing. Mm -hmm. It's everything.